Hello, Sermon Brainwave listeners and viewers. This is Matt Skinner inviting you to join Caroline, Joy, and me at Ghost Ranch Retreat Center, August 11 through 15, 2025. We led a similar preacher's retreat last summer, and it was a huge hit. This one will include presentations and workshops, worship, and lectionary-based study, all designed to enhance your gifts as a biblical preacher. And you'll be nourished by the awe-inspiring landscape of the high desert near Santa Fe, New Mexico. Visit Working Preacher's homepage and click on the link under Preacher's Retreat for more details. Sign up today. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Joy J. Moore. The 17th Sunday after Pentecost falls on September 15th, 2024. And these are the texts. The thematic Old Testament reading is Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 9a. The semi-continuous Old Testament reading is Proverbs 1, 20 through 33. Let's talk about Psalm 116, verses 1 through 9. The epistle reading is James 3, 1 through 12. And from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 8, 27 through 38. If you've been frustrated about Jesus being difficult to understand so far in Mark's gospel, he's quite plain here. <laughs> and, but, and you want him to go back to mystery, probably. Because this is a hard text and a very, very, very climactic and important text in Mark's gospel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. How's that for a setup? <laughs> That's I a setup. Rolled and out it, the red it's... carpet for you, too. And it, it, it occurs in a difficult place. Caesarea Philippi is not safe territory for uh, uh, these uh, faithful followers of Jesus, uh, which makes having this conversation, well, who do you say I am in a place where all of these different uh, idols uh, and um, random gods have been um, acknowledged, uh, worshipped, uh, identified. Uh, so Caesarea Philippi has that uh, location um, a significance as well, which makes this question uh, a significant question, not just where it is in the story, but also uh, where it physically happens. Yeah, they're in their own kind of wilderness. They're in their own, mm -hmm. there's a different kind of boundary land than the desert, mm -hmm. but it's a boundary mm -hmm. land for sure. And of course, it's the, uh, as we know, is the first of the three passion predictions in Mark. And and so it's, I think that's helpful to remember as well that that we're going to hear two more. And it's important to then think about what what has come before each of them and what, what has come after or what comes after. And so that you're you know, I think the first thing you do is look ahead and say, okay, where's the last one? And, and how does that, how does that shape the first one? And what, where have we come between where, where will we go between this first one? And then uh, the last one with regard to uh, what the disciples are hearing, uh, what they're not hearing, what they, uh, what they don't want to hear. <laughs> uh, and so it just, it just puts it in that larger perspective of, you know, that, that it's necessary for Jesus to do this. That's really the Greek, not must, but necessary. Uh, and then how, you know, and then how do we, how do we experience that? Jesus has just, of course, uh, Cured or cured the blind man at Bethsaida, and so what difference does it make that uh, that event then is uh, immediately precedes his first uh, passion prediction? And so it's again, it, it was we were talking about last week. It's again a healing and opening up of of what we see, right, or what we hear, and then and then be, then comes the question: and who do you say that I am? So there's that, that I, that's a, I think that's an important juxtaposition to put this, uh, to put this really important story uh, in locating it in the gospel. The, uh, I, sorry, I was looking at you, Joy. We were both like, yeah, I was, I was, I was going to go in a different direction. So I'm, I'm waiting. People who are watching us on YouTube saw what just happened there. We're both I know like, they're like, uh, uh, okay. Okay. I got you go. <laughs> I'll just take, I'll have a sip of water now. <laughs> Uh, all of that makes what Peter says quite remarkable, that uh -huh. he calls Jesus yes. the Messiah, um, yes. because Jesus hasn't done anything especially messianic. He's done a lot of amazing things, and he looks like a miracle worker mm -hmm. and a teacher and a healer. Uh, 
But the Messiah wasn't necessarily going to be a militaristic figure, wasn't necessarily going to be a violent figure, but he was definitely going to oversee a significant change in the current world order done by God and not necessarily through through violence. And so Peter's imagining the next couple of months, next couple of years with that statement. Interestingly, if Jesus doesn't say, no, you're wrong, mm -hmm. but he does say you don't quite understand it when you get the whole story in here, right? And so part of that, you know, when he says, you're setting your mind, and I'm jumping around the passage, you're setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. That's just an interesting line for me. He doesn't say you're wrong or you're misled. He says, you're thinking too small or you're thinking using the wrong paradigms. And I think part of this comes down to the question of power, like things is, is left undefined, but Jesus still has yet to show what divine power looks like in action. And it's not going to be a Red Sea deliverance. It's not going to be a walls of Jericho. It's not going to be something with a lot of fireworks. It's going to be dying on a cross. And so the idea of what does divine love or divine power or divine influence or divine change look like is yet to still be really radically reoriented. And so I don't think we can fault Peter for wishing for a change, but it's, 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 he's got the whole category wrong, right? He's got the mm -hmm. whole idea of what God's deliverance can, should, will look like. Mm -hmm. And then you get nothing, essentially, except deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me if you want to be a part of this thing, which is all terrifying language to me. Gosh, yeah, yeah. I I was struck this time um, that uh, as 32 begins, all of this conversation is happening quite openly. And then Peter's conversation with Jesus is private. Yeah, that they, they go off to the side and Peter, who's just made this incredible public statement, basically says, Okay, wait a minute now. If 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 I'm not wrong, then what are you talking about? This this can't be. And that that makes for me that really underscores what you just lifted up, Matt. Uh that the not understanding, the having this in the wrong category. Uh and then uh again to underscore what you said, the recognition that for me, these acts that would lead them to say, Oh yeah, this is the one, are grand and great. But what is going to be the definitive act is humility and allowing oneself to suffer and die. And they're not ready to receive that yet. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point because you just get all these claims about Peter of not being able to see and you know, why couldn't he recognize? And, you know, the disciples are clueless, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it I, I did some teaching a couple weeks ago on, uh, on John and, no. and, oh yeah, I know. Surprise. And, uh, and talking about just the way in which our, um, the gospel narratives give space for a growth and realization. So for example, you know, John four, you have this, the longest conversation that Jesus has with anybody in the gospels because, because Jesus can't just show up at the well and say, I'm thirsty, by the way, I'm God. I mean, that, <laughs> that that's just not, you know, <laughs> it's, it's going to take that whole conversation for her to get a little farther in the recognition of who Jesus is. And that's true here. And so before we rebuke Peter, right. Or, or before we say it, it, it I mean, it, the, you know, that Jesus is getting Peter, you know, bringing Peter along wow. to, you know, to um, this unfolding of what, the Messiah is going to look like. And uh, I think that that that's something with which people can resonate and should and and that we maybe talk about in our preaching that this is, you know, the identity of Jesus is not something that we're supposed to understand or get right away. It takes, it happens in revelation and realization and conversation and dialogue and trying things out and then 
uh, and then realizing, okay, that didn't work. Um, and so it, 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 it speaks into a, it speaks into a kind of following of Jesus. I think that is far more dynamic than it is just, you know, just getting all of the answers right. So it's, a, I think it's an important point for that reason as well, especially as we're getting closer to uh, chapter, you know, uh, of chapter 11, um, which, where Jesus will enter into Jerusalem. So. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up what's coming. I would strongly encourage preachers who are working with this text this week and who foresee working with Mark over the next roughly 10 Sundays until year B starts to wrap up in mid-November to look ahead at the other Mark and texts that are coming because the gospel of Mark changes dramatically with this scene here in chapter Mm -hmm. eight. Mm -hmm. The nature of the gospel changes and what Jesus talks about changes, but you're also gonna get now really for the next 10 weeks, a number of different texts that talk about uh, power, the responsible use of power, who's negligent with how they use power, what is exploitation, what's the wrong use of power look like, and why is Jesus so upset about that? How is he offering a different way? Questions about wealth and influence and a a lot of things that are really hard to read because they hit really close to home. And because, like I said, he doesn't He's not very mysterious anymore. He's suddenly talking about things that sound quite familiar. And they matter a lot for how the church, I think, needs to understand its role in the world. Mm -hmm. As No matter where you live, you are in some way a force for cultural change or influence or compassion in the world. And how you help teach yourself to look for the right things, how you put a check on the way in which you as a congregation might crave more power than you possibly have. Uh, and to not lose track of your your original, your base, your foundational calling as a disciple, which is deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow. So, I mean, you've got a chance. You don't have to put it all out there this week. You've got a chance, and you need to, like, start to prepare people for what's coming and be ready for that. So that's my my semi-friendly, semi-scolding uh, encouragement to preachers is that you take that time to just lay out those next 10 weeks and just see what's ahead. Yeah. And you, fellow podcasters. What? We should all be looking ahead 10 weeks. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'm on it. I'm on it. I'm on it. You're on it? We're on it. We're on yeah. it. Okay. Can we look ahead to Isaiah? Yes. Let's do it. If we do that, uh, I think uh, it it follows directly in terms of what you're saying. Um in recognizing the power dynamics and recognizing the influence that we have, just this opening line in how this particular election is divided, um, how to sustain the weary with the word. That's what the tongue of a teacher is, how to sustain the weary with the word, not the not the powerful, not how to lift up uh, those who already believe themselves to be in control or um, uh, desire control, but the tongue of the teacher sustains, supports, encourages, lifts up the weary. Just that, I think, even if you don't um, preach from Isaiah, I think that knowing that context is how we should look ahead for all the text. Yeah, it's a good reflection point for any preacher, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not about winning over the praises of the critics. It's sustaining the weary with the word. Yeah. Yeah, right. And I think, too, verse 7 and 8 are in another other ways to rephrase, if you will, take up your cross. I mean, it, mm-hmm. we didn't talk about this with the Mark text, but the commentary talks about the fact that this is not about a glorification of suffering. Uh, It's to put, you know, to put that and that how much of that uh, has been, how much of that requirement of suffering, you know, for Jesus sake has been so much of, of a lot of people's um, imagination of faith. And that's not what's happening here, but it is a sense of, uh, as what you were talking about, Matt, a sense of taking up your cross is uh, is is setting your face like flint. It's making a decision uh, to stand up for the powerless. It's making a decision to uh, to uh, 
to realize what power to realize what power does that power crushes you but yet nonetheless you'll you're you'll stand up for the power that is revealed in the kingdom of god and so it's uh in and it's standing up together right let them let them confront me because this is what this is what i'm standing for this is this is this is what i what i know to be the the power of the kingdom of God. And that comes with consequences. It makes me want to point out, I don't hear you saying that Jesus is embracing the call to die because it's a call to die. I, Mm-mm. But I, what you're saying makes me want to like Mm-mm. urge people who preach on these texts to think about how what Jesus is I think expressing here is a kind of faithfulness to the mission or faithfulness mm-hmm. to his vocation, to his calling. Right. Like there's a praise of obedience going on here in Isaiah. I'm not so sure Jesus is saying it's necessary that I die. God has chosen me to die. Therefore, I'm going to choose to die as well. Mm-hmm. I think it's more of a sense of, look, it's inevitable for folks like me to get killed. That's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. That's obedience. part of the mission. That's part of the calling, so to speak. Obedience leads to that. Yeah. Exactly. And so there's yeah. this embrace of a self-giving mission. Yes. That, do you know what I mean? And it's very <laughs> subtle and I don't want to... Yeah have a sermon parse that difference, but Mm -hmm. so that people don't come away thinking like, wow, why God chooses God's beloved son to die? You know, the bigger question is how does power operate in the world? What does it mean for God to become subject to that as a means of undoing that? I mean, those, these are huge questions, but to choose one's language carefully about how we Mm -hmm. talk about this obedience. Right. That's resolve. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and going back to uh, the um, Mark text that, as you're saying, if you have this imagination to know what has happened to the prophets, what has happened to those who have come before, who speak God's truth in a radical way of hospitality in a culture that favors power, the result has been over and over again, their outcast, their death, uh, and and. This mission of God is so important that Jesus is willing to be faithful to that mission mm-hmm. at all cost. And that's it's it's a subtle difference in being able to say, I will die for this. Mm-hmm. No, it's I will live for this, even if it cost me my right. position, my prestige, and maybe even my life. Yeah. And that self-denial might lead you to a situation like Psalm 116 seems to be addressing. It might lead <laughs> yeah. you to some kind of a mm-hmm. a, a hardship. Mm-hmm. Well done. Again, the yeah. psalm could be about all sorts of hardships, but like what kind of people pray, oh Lord, save my life, right? What kind of people yeah. say, return, oh my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. I mean, to really enter into that experience mm-hmm. that Jesus is talking about when he talks about self-denial. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so that we don't turn the psalmist into kind of a proxy. You know what I mean? Like we always want right. somebody to suffer on our behalf so we can right. say. Mm-hmm. Because the last line of this particular pericope is, I walk before the Lord where? In yeah. the right. land of the living. Mm-hmm. This, is, this is how I walk and that I walk because God hears me. Mm-hmm. And I, and making that, connection to the psalm i think is can be really helpful for what we were uh, the the particularities and the nuances of what we were just talking about when it comes to um when it comes to jesus mission and jesus mm-hmm. obedience and taking up the mm-hmm. cross and i would also point people to the commentary on the website it does a really carl jacobson it does a really nice job of of recognizing um of recognizing that this is a poem written after a difficult time of life, right? And what you've had to endure. And the psalmist gives us language for uh, going to God or praising God in the midst of that. Um, So, yeah. It's a very poignant commentary. It is. It is. It is. Well, if you listened last week to the podcast, you know that we're now on week two of the Caroline Lewis three-part series on Proverbs. Yeah, right. (laughs) <laughs> what you proposed last week? We do a proverb. You did series. well. I did uh, <laughs> because I think wisdom is a worthwhile homiletical topic, mm-hmm. uh, and 
and the way in which, and we'll get this, of course, next week as well, the way in which wisdom gets personified in Proverbs, which I think is uh, really worth some uh, some theological exploration with regard to how how do we how do we talk about wisdom in our culture? What does it mean? Who is the who are the wise ones? Uh, and and what does wisdom have to say, um, particularly in times of uh, what does God's wisdom have to say, particularly in times of that we find ourselves now of 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 tensions and contentions and uh, and I just it's just something we don't talk about very often, <laughs> you know. God, God's wisdom. We we have a lot to say about God, but wisdom doesn't. It's not in the top ten list of <laughs> theological topics, and so I just I'm 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 particularly interested in it now, uh, and 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 really um, dive, you know a deep dive into the way in which proverbs. Uh, the author of Proverbs casts what wisdom is and what wisdom does. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's the other piece to this. It's not, not just what wisdom is, but how does wisdom act? What is its function mm. uh, in, in our lives? Um, and a uh, function particularly around theological discourse uh, is worth. So yeah, that's my series. I have to I have to admit context makes a lot in how we read and see things both in front of the text from where we read right now um and and I think you're 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 calling us to that we need now in this moment to speak about the wisdom of God uh and um I was struck by uh the commentary um where um Megan just points out um just how clear wisdom cries out in the street mm -hmm. and in the midst of protest. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I was like, Oh my goodness. You know, I, I just, that image is so um, simple and clear. Uh, and so uh, you're underscoring that Caroline and saying in this particular moment where we're real good uh, about Live where well, we're not so good about living in the tension because we're real good about defining our div divisions. Uh, it might do well to recover what does the hospitality that is evident in the wisdom of God. I want to say, what does it look like? Even though when we talk about Proverbs, it's usually about what does it sound like? It's an interesting image that it's in a, it's in a, in a marketplace, so mm -hmm. to speak, right? Or it's in yeah. a public square. There's an interesting right. expression for this right. time of the year in the mm -hmm. United States, at least. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, it has to make a case for itself, right? It's got to entice people and show its value, show its worth. Like wisdom can't just be a kind of a trying to avoid ivory tower discussion in the academy. Kind of. Well, yeah, I was going to say kind of a prima facie, but then like saying something in Latin is kind of like the ivory tower. You know, it, it can't be a kind of self evident. Thing, right? Like, here's wisdom, we know it, therefore, kind of, you know, you have to make a case for it. And, and helping people get a sense that wisdom here is, is more than smartness or knowledge, yeah. just like the foolish aren't dumb. Mm -hmm. The foolish are people who know how to misuse the gifts of God or the wisdom of God for their own ends, right? It's not, this is different from like, how we think about intelligence in this country, right. and or even um, skill. Uh, or technique in this country, that there's something about how does the fear of the Lord manifest itself in one's life and one's choices and one's mm -hmm. relationship, one's business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. One more week yet to come. One more week. Yes. In the three-part series. In the three-part series. Uh, yeah. And, and here we are, week three of James. Yeah, James. Of series. Already in James chapter three, we skipped over all that pesky faith and works stuff. <laughs> Well, not really. Oh, we'll get we'll get to that. We'll we get, didn't get to that. deep into it. We're going to skip over the start of chapter five too, which is a shame. The tongue. No one can claim tame the tongue. Mm. Mm. Is that not evident? Words, power mm. of words, people. Mm -mm. Preachers. Mm -hmm. Well, but also the the just leaning off of where we were. 
um, the words in the public square that are being heard and received, um, are they words of life or are they words of destruction? Um, so please communicate this in a way that the tongue is tamed, uh, that um, the, the tongue, uh, that the words are words of life. Um, that the criticism, the difficulty that is being called out here in James uh, is a challenge for us um, to speak truth and to, to um, offer others um, hope rather than to speak horror and offer others harm. Yeah. It's just a, it's such an important topic, I think, where we are technologically. I mean, depending yeah. upon where you want to go as a preacher, but we people now can create or machines can now create words uh, that um, are based off of other people's words. You can imitate voices yeah. uh, to great effect. I mean, the, and the reason we do that is because words are so powerful, not just to manipulate and to lead, but to evoke memory. I mean, all sorts of mm-hmm. things and to spend some time on that. And as you, as a minister of word and sacrament, uh, and especially in a lot of the streams of the Protestant tradition in particular, have a real high value on this idea mm-hmm. of, word, communication, fidelity, integrity. Yeah, it's a text that might sound like it's just chastising people, but I think what it does is it helps pull us into a deeper appreciation of our speech, of our disclosure, and of God's own speech and God's own disclosure um, in Christ. And what I love about James is it's just, James has this way, it's like, a thing should be a thing. If it's a fresh spring, it's got to be a fresh spring. I mean, there's a simplicity to this that breaks down sometime, but it's just like, yeah, you can't have brackish water come out of a fresh spring or it's not a fresh spring anymore. And so it's just, there's this kind of folk wisdom that's beautiful and charming that's mixed with a deep appreciation for just all the ways in which we have figured out how to oppress our neighbors Mm -hmm. in this Mm -hmm. book. And here it's through words and speech and duplicity. And I think it, I, uh, everything you both just said, and I think it calls, uh, it calls a community, uh, particularly again, in, as we, as they're coming back together after a summer hiatus or whatever, it calls a community into that, uh, a, a realization of the, of the impact of words and, and listening to, Listening to the words around us, the you know the rhetoric around us, uh, and uh, but what is it? Words are never just words; they're communicating, they're communicating the heart and a soul and I, I and ideas. And so I think it just and then the preacher can ask, what is and what is our congregation speaking, right? What 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 are we what are we giving voice to? That um, is it coming from uh, coming coming from our place of, of who we believe God to be and who, who we want others, what we want others to know about God. And so it's just a, it's just, I think it's a really important time altogether to pull back and say, let's just think about this for a little bit. Um, and, and what it says about the, you know, the individual, but also, um, also groups and, and, and congregations that it, um, that words communicate identity and, uh, they, they communicate, um, they, they say more than they say, and it's worth, it's worth, uh, worth it for a congregation to stop and say, what are we saying? Hello again, working preachers. This is Matt Skinner. Earlier in this podcast, we discussed Carl Jacobson's poignant commentary on Psalm 116, one of the texts assigned for Sunday. His words struck us as especially faithful and true, in part because we knew that he himself was contending with a health crisis at the time we were speaking. Soon after we recorded the podcast, however, Carl passed away and his baptism into Christ was made complete. Carl was a frequent contributor to Working Preacher, which means he was a frequent supporter of the vocation all of us share as preachers. Caroline, Joy, and I mourn his passing and pray for his family. We ask you to join all of us at Working Preacher in giving thanks to God for Carl's gifts, life, 
and faithful witness to Jesus Christ. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave, and be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.